the uh, January 6, 2014 City Council work session and Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, let's go around uh, when we have uh, big groups like this where we mixed it up. I'd like to do quick introductions. So Kevin, if you'd start to introduce and then continue on. And those of you with the microphones like this, remember to turn them off once you're done talking. Kevin Kellogg, City Councilman, Ward 1. I'm Sonia Abdelgawad, and I'm the City Council member in Ward 4. Do you want to use this one? Oh. <laughs> I'm Monique Lewis, and I'm on the park board. And yay for the four women. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Mays, park board. I'm Charlene Hubach. I'm on City Council, Ward 4. Jay Holman, parks board. Brian Harris, parks board. Ryan Westcote, City Council, Ward 2. Tim Stidham, Park Board, Ward 1. Jeffrey Stevens, Council Member, Ward 1. Jason Boehner, Council Member, Ward 3. Eric Eastwood, Park Board. Derek Moorhead, Ward 4, City Council. Well, thank you, everybody, and welcome. I'm, I'm uh, of course, Mayor Kirkhoff. You don't know three? It depends on who. Okay. Ward two, right. Ward 2 right now. <laughs> Uh, we do have uh, a number of items on the work session this evening. The first two items uh, involve the, uh, the, the park board. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and cover the first two items and then take a quick five minute break so the park board can scoot and uh, then we'll finish up our uh, items. So Jim, I'll just toss it over to you for the Hawk Ridge Park Master Plan. Thank you, sir. Uh, this evening we have Clark Anderson Partners with us. They were the consultant chosen to work with the community to develop a master plan for Hawk Ridge Park and they have completed their work. Uh, the consultant will present its recommendations to the city council and the park board here tonight. The next steps in this process will be formal acceptance by the park board, which I am told will be January 24th of this month, and creation by the park board of the phase plan for implementing the aspects of this plan with which the park board wishes to move forward. That having been said, I'll introduce uh, our uh, parks director, Mr. John Kennedy, to introduce Clark Anderson Partners. Thank you, Mr. Fearborn. It's been a long process, but it's been a good one. I really feel that the work that has been done on this project is something that we can all be very proud of. Um, Hawk Ridge Park, as we know, has is, is been an area that has been in existence since 2008. And I'm glad to say now that we do have a plan for the future for this park. And that is all due to the hard work of the Clark Henderson Partners. Uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Rick Wise. Uh, Rick's been the heart, the heart and the soul of the team for, for the project. Rick. Uh, thanks, John. Again, my name is Rick Wise. I'm an architect and senior principal with Clark Henderson Partners. I have with me today Joanne Kissel, a senior planner and principal with our firm, uh, Josh Simpson a landscape architect with our firm, and Sean Ray, also a landscape architect with our firm. First off, this has been a fun and exciting process for us. We have enjoyed getting to know the city of Raymore, uh, getting to know your the people that live here, um, and getting to be a better part of the community. Um, I'm gonna lead off the presentation, but we are gonna switch off. Each of us are have a certain or a different part or role in this presentation. Um, the people behind me did most of the work, so I'm gonna let them talk the most. Um, the process that we started, um, as John uh, mentioned, has been a fun one, but we started it uh, late part of the summer um, with first developing a, a steering committee and establishing goals for the project. The steering committee involved uh, John himself, um, Joan Vahig, Sheldon um, Castleman, Danny Carmichael, Tim Steedham and Michelle Steedham, um, each having uh, a voice in this process. Um, the next phase was community engagement. Um, this is where we really tried to get as much information from the community as possible to really get a handle on what should happen at Hawk Ridge. Um, we attended the, uh, the Raymore Festival, had a booth there, um, really trying to get people engaged in the process and get, get them excited about it. We also had the Mind Mixer website which turned out to be a great tool. We got lots of input. Um, Joanne can mention um, all the different, uh, or the number of people that participated in that, but we got a, a wide variety of comments and engagement from most of the community. Um, and then we had public meetings where we tried to bring people in um, and get input face-to-face -face, uh, in that process. 
the data gathering process um, is really figuring out what Hawk Ridge Park is, um, looking at the natural landscape and understanding that, that landscape and trying to best understand um, how the park should be developed in the future. Um, from that, we developed some initial master plan concepts, um, taking the information we gathered through, the, through the, the Mind Mixer website and from the goals that we had initially established and use those as a test point to what the project or what the master plan should become. And inevitably, we've developed a final master plan that we have uh, presented to the park board um, and obviously made some tweaks along the way, but I think it is a true reflection of what is um, the right fit for, for Hawk Ridge. Um, as uh, Rick said, we began the process by looking at the existing site to see what it would tell us. Uh, we think it's important that any park project or any landscape project really lets the land speak for itself first of all. So we did some analysis of um, the existing land uses in the areas. We looked at natural systems in place such as the drainage way, the lake, the existing wetlands areas. We looked at circulation systems that were around the lake including vehicular access, uh, neighborhood development, uh, pedestrian connections. Um, at the result of that process was uh, that we identified some areas um, early on that we saw as more developable than others. And you know, it's interesting, it's a 79 acre site, which sounds like a pretty big park, but when you start, when you go through that initial analysis, you realize, you know, you take the lake out of that and you take some of the to uh, topography challenges, and really you have some limited, uh, you know, much, it's much more limited site uh, for active recreation than you might think. Um, the areas in blue are the areas that we said are the most developable for active recreation. Um, I guess I can do this. Um, one of the things that has been most enjoyable about this whole project is getting to know your community better, and I have to say that the two days I spent at the Raymore Festival were some of the more enjoyable I've had this year. In fact, I recognize several faces here that I think probably met. And of course, spent a lot of time with Monique and Brian, who helped um, man the booth with us. Um, the, you know, obviously people came by because they were curious what's going to happen. Uh, and this, at this stage of the game, we didn't have answers. We had questions for them. Uh, we had activities for kids to do. We had them draw little pictures of what the park might be. And in general, we just tried to take the, the temperature of the community. What are, what are people saying? What are people thinking? Um, something that started to become clear at the festival and, and really throughout the whole process was that this park should not lose its um, sort of natural uh, amenities, its natural um, uh, assets. And uh, that became clear throughout the the, the whole process. In fact, uh, we also, in addition to the festival, which happened in September, in um, October and November, we had a series of community meetings. The first one we called a vision meeting, and the second one was a community meeting for us to share the alternatives we developed. And a consensus really began building pretty strongly of what should be in the park and what shouldn't be in the park. One of the valuable um, tools that we used uh, was this Mind Mixer website. I'm curious how many of you um, actually logged in and used the Mind Mixer website. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, actually, we had 1,400 people that were invited because what we were doing at that Raymore Festival uh, was a gathering emails and and email addresses so that we could stay in contact with people who ex had expressed an interest. So 1,400 people we reached out to and over 200 regularly started participating in the website and telling us what they, what they think. Um, that allowed us to do some more, um, oh, I would call it empirical um, analysis of what do, what do citizens of the community want. And what we heard was people love trails uh, for this site. People love to go fishing there. Again, protect nature. Uh, don't make dramatic urbanization sort of changes to the park. Um, we, and I'll come back to some other active uses that we talked about. The other thing we uh, did at one of those public meetings is we talked about 
park trends. These are things that are happening around the country. Uh, there were, I don't know, at least a, a dozen or more trends we talked about. This is just a sample of a few of them. Um, this was, uh, the reason we did this is to tell you not only what other communities are doing and thinking about their parks, but how they've addressed those things. In other words, what are the best practices that we're starting to see around the country in terms of park planning? Clearly, fitness is a really big one. Uh, trails, um, we've really seen uh, a, a dramatic change in how communities view trails. It used to be a trail in your backyard was something kind of scary, and now it's one of the things that real, realtors mention first as an asset for home ownership. Um, we also heard a lot about dogs um, while we were talking to people, and clearly we've become a very dog-centered sort of community. And we heard a lot about how recreational needs are changing. Not every park needs to be uh, for formal education, competitive sports, and that kind of thing. We have a population that's changing, and they want more variety in what's, what's offered. So all of that input then got turned into uh, our first two alternatives. Um, we had very creative names for them. They were called A and B. Uh, and they were very similar uh, approaches to the park uh, with a couple notable exceptions, and, and I'll talk about those um, on this slide. Uh, first of all, one of the uses that we heard a lot about in terms of active uses is the desire, desire to have a disc golf course in this community. The question that the community is grappling with and you are grappling with is where is the best location? Um, the difference between our concept A and B, we had disc golf shown in both locations, um, but the, in A, the top one, it was kind of a linear course that circled the perimeter of the park. Um, and in B, it was more confined to one area of the park. Um, we also had a dog park shown. Um, and in A, the dog park is kind of surrounded by disc golf. And in B, we kept those two very separate. The challenge of the park that we find out, found out through our process was um, that we needed to control potential conflicts of use. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, trails are very important to this community, and this is a perfect site for a lot of trail activity, which uh, Josh and Sean will talk about in a minute. But we saw a potential for conflicts with disc golf and a lot of the trails and other more nature-centered activities. Ultimately, at uh, a park board meeting in November, the decision was maybe we're, maybe we're forcing disc golf into this park and it's not working very well. So at that point in time, the decision was made to pull disc, uh, disc golf off of this park. The dog park, on the other hand, still we are showing uh, a, a location for that. Um, the other thing that came through in our discussions with folks and our research about the park is somebody made a great idea a long time ago to name this Hawkridge Park. <clears throat> and we thought that was really a, a fortuitous um, thing to happen because the hawk provides great imagery and great symbolism that we can play off on the park. First of all, because the park, excuse me, the hawk is a symbol um, in a lot of cultures, Native American cultures in particular, of things like the interconnectedness between man and nature. We think that's an important thing we can play up in the park. The other thing about the hawk, um, they, they marry for life, they rear their young together. You might say it's a family sort of symbol, and that's something we heard um, in our community input, is give us a park that is really centered on what families can do together, not just a place to drop off your kid for them to have their experience. Um, so we really are using the hawk as both as a metaphor for what this park can be and also some literal terminology that you're going to hear about in a, in a moment. Which leads me to what we're really going to talk about tonight. That was all history. Now we're, I'm going to, uh, Josh and Sean are going to bring you up to speed with where we are tonight and the recommendations that we have for Hawkridge Park. So this here is the, the final master plan at its kind of full build-out scale, and we're going to zoom around the plan and get into a little more detail about these pieces, but um, kind of from a, a big picture standpoint, um, 
the, the kind of the heart and core of the park is shown kind of in the center on the northwest side of the lake in an area that we're calling the Hawk's Nest. Uh, this is near the main entrance and then the main parking area adjacent to a children's area called the Nestlings Playground. Um, to the west of that, we have um, an open lawn space for passive uses um, surrounded by native grass areas that have a variety of trails through them. Um, moving to the east side of the lake, um, we have, we've reserved some areas along the, the extreme east side where Sunset Lane will eventually be built. Um, you know, since the timeline on that is a little vague at this point, we're just reserving the space kind of in a long-term planning effort. Um, but we also have a, a lookout tower and a pavilion space down there that we'll get in a little more detail about. Um, a space reserved for a dog park and a secondary uh, parking area with um, a, another restroom building down there. But um, we'll zoom through this site and get into a little more detail about the pieces. Uh, this is that hawk's nest um, area that I had mentioned is kind of the heart and core of the park. Um, you can see it's there where that existing parking lot is currently at the end of uh, Johnston Drive. Um, this would have a main building that has restroom facilities, maybe storage for the park, a linear plaza space that really directs your views across the lake. Um, so as you come into the park, there'd be an entry sign, um, and you would see that main building kind of as a focal point. And once you get out of your car and you're in that space, you're reoriented to have views across the lake and down a fishing pier as well, which would be ADA accessible, um, and it would be the main fishing pier uh, for this park. Uh, and again, like I said, the, there's there's some parking immediately adjacent to the uh, main building there, just to the um, the west side. Um, and we did a few renderings as a part of this. Um, so this would kind of be the entry sign as you're coming off Johnson Drive. Um, you know, you'd have have the street and you'd have sidewalks that connect to the surrounding neighborhoods. One of our main goals here is connectivity with the surrounding areas so you can get pedestrian use from the people that live nearby and uh, vehicular, vehicular use from people that maybe live a little bit further away and would have to drive to the site. Um, but you can see the uh, you can see the uh, kind of main uh, building structure beyond which would kind of draw you into the park. Um, here's another rendering that we had done. This is once you're on that plaza space, you can look across the lake. Um, there's a few shade structures to provide seating elements and kind of frame that view across the lake. And you can see off there in the distance the uh, fishing pier uh, down at the end. Um, adjacent to this hawk's nest kind of uh, main plaza space, uh, we're having an area called the Nestlings Playground, which is kind of a more children's oriented area um, adjacent to. Uh, parking for easy access if you're you know, a, a single parent with kids, for example, um, also adjacent to the restroom building. Um, this area would have kind of nature-based uh, play spaces for kids, um, and it would be adjacent to a, a children's nature walk, which would have, it's, it's kind of a smaller scale nature walk that's kind of, it's not isolated, but it's its, its own pathway more geared toward uh, children with you know, children's educational opportunities and uh, secondary trails coming off of it but it's really the kind of a, a children's space within this park. Um, and we have a rendering of that as well, um, just some nature-based uh, play in this area. Um, this is across, across the lake here. Uh, you know, if you're looking down that plaza space, you can see across the lake, and you would see uh, this kind of pavilion. We're calling it the spiraling pavilion, kind of going back to that um, the concept of the hawk, and the hawk you know, having a spiraling motion as it's flying. Uh, but this would be a focal point from across the lake, uh, but could also be used for uh, small gatherings, uh, small concerts, a small concert venue. Um, and uh, part of this also provides kind of a large open lawn space. One of the goals here too was to uh, to have you know areas that have native grass, but then areas have that have kind of open mode spaces that could be used for a variety of things. And uh, this kind of large slope lawn looks toward the lake and has views across the lake, so you can see people maybe just laying out there on a, a nice warm afternoon. Um, and we have a rendering of, you know, rendering of that. Um, like, like I was talking about before, there are some open lawn spaces. There's another large open lawn space kind of on the west side of the site as well. Um, this area is a little more flat, so you could have um, you know, passive recreational opportunities if somebody wanted to have a flag football game, something like that and it's adjacent to shelters. This plan also kind of locates where the shelters are at as a part of this master plan. 
Uh, we have shelters over here to the west, adjacent to parking areas. Um, more shelters here to the south with views across the lake and uh, access to the adjacent parking down here. And uh, an additional shelter out here, a little more isolated, just to provide a little bit of variety, um, depending on how people might want to use their shelters. Um, adjacent to that spiraling pavilion um, that we've kind of been talking about before, we have this area that we're calling the Hawks View Point. Um, it's at the high point of the park, so we kind of wanted to um, reinforce that even further with something such as a lookout tower, um, something to kind of provide the perspective of a hawk, something a little more unique uh, to this area, and something to kind of draw you through the park to the tower. Um, you know, if people are parking to the south or to the uh, west, you know, they would use the trail system within the park to access this point, and it would provide kind of a unique perspective. Uh, there's great views to the north, south, east, west, all directions um, from this point. We have a rendering of that as well. Oh. This, is the, this is that pavilion space looking toward it um, from that lookout tower with a kind of a small concert going on. Um, and then kind of some open passive space with people you know, just sitting around looking toward the lake. Um, this here is the Red Tail Landing to the south of the park, um, or sorry, south of the lake. Uh, there's a parking area with drop-off, just provides a little bit of additional parking to the south side of the, the park. It's kind of a large park just to have one main parking space. So one of our goals here was to spread out the parking a little bit, depending on maybe which part of the park people would be using. Um, this would have a secondary restroom building as well as a couple of shelter buildings. Um, this is going back to that Hawks viewpoint, um, kind of a lookout tower space. Um, this would kind of be kind of a concept of what it could look like um, once it got built. But it would have views in all directions and across the lake. Um, part of the planning process within this was figuring out how trail systems could work with the existing topography so we're not disturbing the area too much and the trails are, um, are easy to build and meet ADA code which you know be 5% or less slope. Um, so there's a variety of trails within the site. Um, one of the main goals was to connect in all directions, north, south, east, and west, with a six-foot wide concrete trail, which matches the city's existing uh, you know, biking trail system that they have in place. Um, so we would connect to uh, the adjacent neighborhoods with trails such as that and have that kind of a trail be around the perimeter of the lake. So you could have people, you know, people want to run around the lake or you know, bike to the lake and bike around it. Um, that trail, that trail network provides kind of the the, the primary. Um, it's kind of the primary system within the park that everything's kind of organized around and it connects to all the major pieces within the park. Um, from there, there's secondary trails, six foot wide concrete trails and aggregate trails, which could maybe at a later point be paved. Um, that was kind of at this point for budgetary considerations. Um, and we're also looking at incorporating some mowed trails within the site. So the areas where you do have native grass, as you can kind of see here in this photo at the bottom, um, the Parks Department could choose to mow trails within that space, and over time they could change to provide a little bit of variety for the people using the park. Um, you know, maybe it changes over time to create different unique experiences as people keep returning to the park. Um, we also do show a couple of bridges to um, bridge areas where there are riparian areas that we're not looking to disturb as a part of this project. Um, and it, along that trail system, we're looking at incorporating educational nodes, um, areas where you can learn about um, nature and um, also kind of small outdoor classroom spaces. It'd be similar to what's happening along the children's nature walk, but uh, maybe more geared toward adults, uh, young adults, teenagers, things like that. Um, and these, these pieces are kind of located in areas in the park that where people would be walking as they're drawn through the park to the tower, for example, or to the pavilion space. So really trying to connect people with nature through educational opportunities. And now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, phasing and budget. divided the site into uh, three phases. Uh, the first phase is park infrastructure, and that's really a lot of the stuff like the trail system that ties all the other pieces of the park together. 
um, some of the other features that are included in phase one would be the hawk's nest um, and then the main drive and the parking lot. Okay. Um, phase two is the project areas, um, and this includes the nestlings playground, uh, hawk's viewpoint, spiraling pavilion, um, the dog park, and red tail landing. And um, you know these areas. This is something that could be broken out into further phases if needed to be. And then, Mr. Mayor, three. can they talk into the microphone a little bit closer? I'm having a trouble hearing it with a fan. Um, and then, phase three um, includes it's the long term, and that is includes the parking area on the east side, um, the nature center, and uh, Sunset Lane. And then just a summary of all three phases. We handed out a detailed estimate of the different pieces and parts just to give you some backup of how those num numbers were generated. Um, the, budget the budgeting and the phasing is completely up to the park board and you all to determine what makes the most sense. Um, we just tried to break it down into what pieces seemed to make sense. Um, but obviously that's going to be based upon what funding you have and how you want to move, move forward with the master plan. But I think it should give you a good guide point uh, to that process. Questions? Are there any questions? All of that, no questions? Oh, please, go ahead. <laughs> please do. I had a question, and it had to do with the wind. As you all know that live here in Raymore, that area on 58 Highway is so windy that when we tried to put up flags and everything uh, for banners, they, uh, the wind kept blowing them down. And I was wondering if the wind would be any kind of a problem over there in Hawk Ridge, especially when I saw some of the things that looked like they were elevated, that uh, the, the one place where it looked like a, like a fire tower. And I just wondered if, if uh, the elements had been taken into consideration on any of this, because wind is a problem here. We sit high. Remore is the highest elevation in the county, and so we do sit high, and we do have trouble with uh, wind. Okay. Um, I think the, the topography of the, of the of the whole park is a little bit different as you look around it. Obviously the lake is the low point and it's going to be the most protected area. Um, there is a tree line that follows along the west edge and I believe most of the north edge. So I think there is a little bit of protection from the wind. Obviously the design of the structures like the, the, the tower you mentioned would need to be designed such that you're, uh, it's structurally feasible to make sure that it doesn't blow over obviously. <laughs> Um, but wind is going to be a natural point of the site, but I think it is part of the design is to make the site be as natural as possible. So the fact that there is wind um, throughout it uh, is actually part of the natural character of that area. So I think um, you'd want to celebrate that as well. Go ahead. Can you share with me again the rationale for not putting the disc golf course in, in this park? Well, uh, part of the history is we, we heard lots of comments through uh, Mind Mixer and through the, the festival um, and from the visioning committee that disc golf is a need. Um, so we did look at the, it extensively. Um, we looked at both a nine hole and an 18 hole course. Um, we looked at two initial solutions as Joanne mentioned earlier. The first solution put the disc golf um, primarily around the perimeter. We were trying to take advantage of um, the trees that exist uh, and we were trying to minimize the conflict between the disc golf and other functions. So putting around the perimeter made some sense. However, when we did that, um, when you wrapped around from first the, fir the beginning of the first, uh, the hole to the end, the two didn't come together. So there was a disconnect between the starting point and the ending point um, that seemed problematic for the people that were playing disc golf. The other solution um, 
put it all up in that northwest corner. Um, and the concern there is that it may have been not taking advantage of enough of the park, that it was really isolated and a little too clustered. Um, so at that point, I think the, the park board and, and members of that group decided that uh, maybe this wasn't the best location for that. Uh, you know, I think we, there are opportunities to put it on this site, but in the end, I think it was decided it wasn't the right location. Go ahead. I, I was heavily involved in that discussion. Um, that northwest corner right now is just a flat field for the most part. I mean, it's, it's, it's baled for hay right now. So there's not a lot of trees up in that, in that quadrant. And whether you took the disc golf course out or left it in, it's, I mean, the design did not change much if you took it out or put it in. Um, so to put it in the, put a disc golf course in there, it, it, at this point doesn't make much sense without the trees and the other, other parts of that park there. Um, um, What's that? Yeah, it's just, it's not really suitable at, for the location and, the, and working with the rest of the design. Um, the other, other point I'd make is it could go in there at a later time, but without knowing where the trails are and where the trees look like, it's really hard to design a course um, within something like that. Mm -hmm. so we've got other ideas about where that could be. Um, I talked about it at one of our last joint sessions. We're going to be revisiting that at our next session. Sonia, did you want to? I was, I was just going to say, I remember reading in the park board notes that um, w you guys were kind of back to talking about it maybe at Moon Valley Park again, which was the original thought of where maybe that would fit in our park system. So, Is the golf course that's already existing in that area, is that privately and the not open to the public in any way, shape, or form. The one at Creekmore. It's a private golf course. That's correct. It's private. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's just such a short distance from there. It seemed to me that it, rather than spending any money on a golf course, it would be better to see if we couldn't work out some sort of an arrangement. No, they they were talking not about it. No, been, not well, not I'm talking about any golf course. This is a disc golf course. Frisbees. It's not with golf balls. It's with frisbees. Okay. I, I guess what I'm saying is so with eight pound. <laughs> Jay, did you have a comment? I did. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. Obviously, it's conceptual, but the the slide uh, on our handouts at slide seven kind of showed the trail system. If you could go back to that, that's possible. Okay. Forward or backwards? Delineated by different colors. It's quite a ways into the presentations. Towards on page the seven. Page seven. Yeah, it's page seven on our handout. It's right in the middle. It's right after the tower. That, that's slide. it there. there it's hard to tell from this, but uh, uh, it would appear that the spiraling pavilion and then obviously the red outlined uh, concrete trail around the uh, uh, the lake. I don't know exactly how close those are to that, but obviously a natural water feature. We get a lot of rain. That that is that stuff going to be underwater, and is that something that you looked at, or what? what do you have any inf additional information on what would happen when we have like a basically a flooding type scenario in those areas? Well, this this lake is a flood control structure for the area, so it's designed to obviously take the rain that comes in. Um, one of the pro parts of the project, and it shows up more in the estimate detail. One of the things that needs to happen is stabilization of the bank area around the lake is important. Um, so that would need to happen pretty early on in the process. But obviously, yeah, we would want to look at you know high flow levels for, for that lake and making sure that the, uh, the paved areas aren't impacted by, by that. We do know um, we do have some low points along the lake that would require the addition of a bridge, a pedestrian bridge. Um, because that area does get flooded out or at least is in water uh, for good parts of the year. So uh, as part of the design process, as it moves forward, you would definitely need to look at uh, inflow up to that lake and, and making sure that that's not impacted. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? 
John? If I could just say a couple things real quick. The most obvious question is what's next? And, and like Mr. Fearborn said, uh, in the January 24th Park Board meeting, we will be addressing this and adopting it uh, formally if, if the Park Board so does desire. And, and if they do adopt the plan, then the next step will be is to look at how we want to phase part of this, all of this, or even none of this, if they so desire, into this park area. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy, like I said earlier, with the process and how this was designed and how it was brought forth uh, from, this, from this group over here. I think the consultants did an excellent job. Uh, the Park Board has had ample opportunity and have done a great job of putting in their suggestions and thoughts, and I think the public has too. So now I think it, we just need to go out and sell this plan. Uh, the only way I see this park being built is a combination of public and private money. And that is something that I think the Park Board will definitely want to pursue, looking at the budget that we have, obviously, but also trying to reinforce that with private funds to make this park a reality. Um, I'd like to thank these guys, first of all, but also all the public and the Park Board and the, and the original steering committee for all the hard work and time they put into this. It's, it's truly been an enjoyable trek, um, and I, I look forward to seeing what this park can be in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Uh, that's, uh, there's a lot of neat stuff there that, I, that a lot of people uh, I know will be attracted to. Uh, it takes care of a number of needs that I've heard the community ask for. Will this uh, PowerPoint presentation be put on our website for people to look at? or? Yes, we can do that. Okay, I think it'd be a good idea uh, to start the marketing of this thing, uh, perhaps after the uh, the meeting on the twenty fourth, because if the park board decides right. against it, yeah, it uh, probably would not be a good idea to have drummed up a lot of interest on it. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate the, the opportunity to be involved, Mr. Mayor. Could we hear a little bit more? <clears throat> Could we hear a little bit more about phase one, what all they would plan to do on, on that? Because I'm assuming that would be the, it's going to be done in phases, right? To, to respond to that, I don't really think we know yet for sure. We, the, the things that came out to be the most popular items were the trails, access to the lake, which would possibly be some type of fishing pier, and, and fishing in general. So those are the things I think we will address first. Now, obviously, we have to have parking, uh, maybe a restroom. So there's a lot to consider. But I, I think as the Park Board formulates a plan to go forward, those are things they, they will consider, plus other things that have been brought forth. So it, at this point, I can't really answer that. I'm sorry. And, and it may not just be two phases. It may be eight phases, right? I mean. It, over a long, much longer period of time, but, but it's going to, it will ha uh, have some sort of orderly process to it. I mean, we're not going to put in, you know, a restroom facility with no way to get to it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And the next item is this your item too? John? Yes, that's ours. Well, I'll, I'll toss it over to Jim. Jim, you can toss it to John. I'll toss it to John. <laughs> <laughs> the farmer's market area has been an area that it has now been two years since we started having uh, the farmer's market in. Needless to say, the market has been a great success. We've had as many as 32 vendors on any given Tuesday night. Uh, we've had great public support. And uh, there's been some park development, but very limited. Uh, we have put together an a in-house committee of, of uh, city staff, uh, which, in, which includes uh, Mike Crass, um, Jim Cataret, uh, Steve Rulo myself and Heather Eisenbarth to, to develop this park or at least give some, some thought to it to 
do some preliminary work to present to the park board and to the council for your review. Um, this year there is funding in the amount of $150,000 uh, to be used to, for park development. But also one of the things we, we looked at early on was we basically own half the block. And the other half is, is owned by two parties, um, the, uh, the First Baptist Church of Raymore, and then there's a private party that owns the, the two lots uh, on the far end. And what we did early on was address this with the church to find out if they might have some interest in working with the city and the Parks and Recreation Department in uh, developing this land as part of the park. Um, the church made reference to the fact that they don't have any immediate plans for this park, but in the future, they do have plans as to what they might want to do with this park. And it could be anything from an activity facility to parking. So they were not interested in selling the park to the city, but they were very interested in possibly developing an MOU uh, to, to allow the city to use this as recreational space, as park space. So with that in mind, uh, we put together a committee, a couple people from the park, a couple people from the park board, uh, developed an initial MOU. It was reviewed by the park board and also by uh, the church elders. Came back, uh, developed a second MOU, which led to a third MOU. This third MOU has now been approved, or at least reviewed by the park board and, and tentatively approved. Uh, the church is still looking at it. Uh, they'd hoped to have something to us before this meeting, but we're not able to provide that. So with that in mind, uh, we're still waiting for the response to the third MOU. Uh, what we see in this area is, is some passive recreational pursuits, probably nothing of, of great permanence because the MOU addresses this for 10 year periods. So with that in mind, we don't really want to go in there and build a structure because at that point, if they decided they did want to initiate use of this area for, for church-related activities, um, that would not be good. So we do want to expand the park. We do want to use this property. But at the same time, we want to do it in cooperation with the church, with their support, and hopefully a little bit of their guidance. Uh, what you see before you today is the draft MOU, again, in its third version. Um, the park board has had a lot of comment and input on this and uh, it's this mostly is just to inform you as to where we are now in the process see if you have any questions concerning the MOU and its current phase any any comments you might have and again like I said we will probably be appearing before you upon review by the church and their answer as far as this latest version any questions you might have questions uh, councilman some months ago, we had something similar to come this come up with another uh, a church organization. And at that time, our concern was using public funds for private uh, purposes. And I see that we're going to be doing the same thing again on this. And I just wondered how it differed and if the position of the council had changed any. I don't see anybody come up. Oh, there we go. I guess it's sort of along the same lines, uh, but not a comment directly to uh, Mrs. Hubach's question, but the city's looking at $6,500 expense. Um, are we gonna get $6,500 out of using this property? I think if you prorate that, Councilman, over a 10 year period, without a doubt. Um, this, this park will be almost approximately twice in size by the utilization of this land. Um, it's, it's a relatively narrow strip and with all the things that have been brought forth as suggestions to be placed in this park, it would be tough. So with this in mind, this additional property allows park expansion, recreation program expansion, and it's, it's gonna ultimately benefit everyone, including the church. Mm -hmm. Adding on to that, then, um, is the design? You know, we've they've talked about putting you know a pavilion or some type of stage area in, uh, whether that's a gazebo or you know different ideas have floated around. 
will that be designed in such a way that if the church decides to use this property for their own purposes, it doesn't interfere with the city's use of that half a block? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's one of the biggest considerations in the design is we know that anything that goes over there on the church property is, could be very temporary in nature. And one final question. And then it, somebody else gets to talk. I, 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 <laughs> uh, since this is an MOU for 10 years, um, if the church after two years decides that they want to use it for their purposes, is the city going to be able to recoup any of their costs for uh, removing that basement? Those considerations are spelled out in the MOU. If, if the church does so desire, the city will be able to go in and take anything out that they placed. But this isn't, this isn't the features that they're adding in. This is actually for the removal of the basement. It's my understanding the church, at their cost, is going to remove the, the building, and the city's responsible for removing, remov uh, removal of the basement. So my question is, is if that, in that 10-year period of time, if the church decides to use it for their own purposes, is the city going to be able to recoup any of that $6,500 that we spent to remove the basement to make that a solid foundation for whatever goes forward? That's a very good question. It's not addressed directly in this MOU. Uh, and, and what this is, this MOU is, is just the pre-stage of having legal counsel look at it, and that may be a consideration that has to be added in when the, t when the two attorneys negotiate out what this actual MOU will be. Others? Go ahead. I've got, I've got one, John, and I, and I think we talked about this last month. I've just got um, on section 6B, uh, no service of alcohol shall be permitted in the subject area, defined subject, pertains to this MOU. Is that the entire, or is that the uh, land that we're going to be doing from the church? Yes, it's just the property that the church and the okay. city are agreeing to operate together. It's ambiguous. I just wanted to Fine, thank you. Councilman? There needs to be a sidewalk all the way around there, and there's only one there, and the one that's on um, Olive Street is in very poor condition. So who pays for that? Is that something that the city will pay for, or is that something that the, um, especially in the area that's uh, owned by the church, will they pay for? Uh, I would assume, and, and I'll look to the city staff, but uh, if the sidewalk is within um, what, what, what is the, the area that the city controls, the city would put the sidewalk in. Eastman, thank you. It's one of those times where I, I knew what the word was, I just couldn't remember what the word was. But if, if, if the uh, sidewalk would go in, within the easement, the city easement, I would think that the city would put it in. So on Adams Street, we would put it in on Adams Street then? If, if we were to put a sidewalk there, and if there, it is my understanding, if there is an easement there for the city to put a sidewalk in, and if the city chose to put a sidewalk in, then the city would put a sidewalk in. We might ask for some clarification from Mike Kras relative to how that is programmed. Mike? And knowing that area. Um, right now, within the original town master plan, which is pretty much serving the basis of the concept design for for the uh, farmers market that the team is working on it does contemplate a sidewalk along Olive Street and we are we are kind of holding off on programming that into this into the five-year CIP until we get a little further along with the design for the farmers market area because we're not really sure um, how, how that sidewalk is going to is really going to go between Adam Street and Washington there's uh, some of the concept is to make it an integral part within the park and then continue out to to Madison Street because it, that sidewalk is relatively narrow and in in disrepair so um, long term uh, as part of the original town master plan there is a sidewalk contemplated along Olive Street we're just holding off on programming that till we get a little further along with the concept design for the farmers market area okay. thanks Mike other questions nope go ahead I just wanted to make a statement. I don't have a financial interest in this, but I do have it an emotional one because my parents built that house and lived in there until their death. So hmm. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out whether I'm going to vote for or, or 
or, or say that I have a conflict of interest. Okay, I, uh, if nobody else has any other questions, I did have a couple um, that I, I would like. Uh, the, the first question is, there are some trees in that area. Are, are the trees gonna be left there? Those trees are awesome. There yeah, are some well, yeah. beautiful, beautiful oak trees. And yeah, anything that is done will be with absolute protection of those trees. Good. We Good. think they're just quite an asset to the well, area. Yeah, and, and, and I've noticed, noted this uh, during many of the council meetings that one of the oddest things occurs uh, on Tuesday afternoons uh, in the middle of summer, and even in August, the temperature drops precipitously to about 70 degrees, except for that one day uh, last year that was warm and the trees provided a lot of shade, so that was a good thing. My second question was uh, in section 5C, special events, number one, where it says up to three times in a calendar year, the church in conjunction with the city would permit, uh, permitted to conduct special events, which I think is a great idea. Uh, and it ends uh, uh, that the park will be closed to the general public for short periods of time. A and I assume that once the lawyers get a hold of this, they will define what a short period of time is. Mr. Mayor, we have special use permits where we allow certain parts of parks to be more or less reserved mm -hmm. for the public usually it's just a shelter area but we had a special event permit request just this week for this park area for a family that wanted to have a family reunion and have all their activities within this park and they basically wanted to ask the question if they could close the park down for their family reunion we have not responded it's going to be on the park board agenda for discussion oh they're, they're not wanting it this week no, they're wanting oh, okay. It. I was going to, that, that's a brave group there. <laughs> July 17th is okay. when they're asking for. I should have clarified that. I apologize. <laughs> okay, got the request this week. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That answers all the questions that I had. Were, were there any other questions or comments? Go ahead. John, I don't know if we've discussed this before, before or not, but I know we've had, at the very minimum, moderate success with the farmer's market and it's kind of confusing at times because it's listed as the farmer's market market or market area but uh, it is one of the agendas for wanting to secure this piece of property to expand that concept when we have that going on uh, one night a week I know it it seems to get a little bit bigger each year I would seem that it would seem to me that that would be kind of a natural reason to at least uh, pursue that I'm just curious if that's it or if this is a kind of a separate function agenda the, the farmer's market area would still be principally located in the existing area that we have now, Jay, and right. that's, that's property owned by the city. Right. Anything and everything else uh, would be considered for that other part, but again, it's, it's going to be pretty temporary in nature. Right. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions, uh, Councilman? I know we've asked this question before, but I mean, what... I just would like to have a better picture of what you're, what you're planning. I feel like everything you're telling us is very vague. It's going to be temporary. It's going to be with the farmer's market. But what do you have kind of a long-term plan picture for this park? When we talked about the money for the park and the park plan and where that money was going to be spent, um, that was a question. And we never really, uh, there, there might be a structure built on the property. I mean, I don't, I feel like we don't have any, pic I don't have any picture of what this might look like. So could you expand on that a little bit? Maybe that would help us understand this. If, if the council and the park board both remember, we initially had $40,000 in the park budget for design purposes for this park. After we talked amongst ourselves and kind of looked at the park in general, we decided that it would be more responsible if we did it within house because it is only it's less than a park area so that forty thousand dollars went back to general fund upon that a, again a committee was formed with with mike crass and myself and steve rullo and heather eisenbarth and and jim cataract and we've had one meeting have a second meeting scheduled for this week and and that is our goal is to come up with uh more or less a master plan just like you saw tonight for hawk ridge park to present both to the park board and to the council eventually as to what we envision for this park to be uh, when we get to a certain point we will want to have public meetings and input 
as to to what the city and what the citizens of this community see this park to be too so I apologize I can't answer your question yet because it's still very early in the design phase uh, I do not see anything different for the farmers market for 2014 as far as a structure or anything anything that would probably be built in this park will be after October of this year because uh, we do not want to go in there and totally disturb and destroy the park area uh, and that would have a negative effect on the farmers market so anything that we do, I would presume, would be after that time. Can I just oh, follow sorry. up on that real quick? And that kind of goes back to, in my opinion, to where we started. I think it's myself as a council member, it's hard for me to say, yeah, let's make this deal with the church. When, when we had the whole dog park thing, the big issue was us putting so much money into it and then it not being a permanent structure in our city. And so not knowing what the plan is for this property makes me just a little hesitant. Does, I hope that makes sense to do this when, you know, I understand the first step would be to determine how much property we have there, but then the second step, what are we gonna do with it? What are we gonna put on it? But we don't want to borrow property and spend a lot of money on it and then we lose that money. I, I totally understand your hesitation and, and agree 100%. We, we will have a plan as to what we think is going to be the most feasible uh, and best use of, of tax dollars for this piece of side of half of the park that we're looking to do this. Um, it, it would make no sense to, to spend a lot of money over there if we thought there was any chance that in a very short term that whatever we put in there, we can't take with us. And, and that will be the goal. Now, obviously, sidewalks and things, concrete, that's a little difficult to take with you. But short of that, anything that I see that we would put in there would be able to pull up and put in another park area and reused uh, in its current form in another park. So that's, that's the vision that I see as, as far as that half of the park. Kevin? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess my comments are more of comments than questions. Uh, Maybe I need some re-clarification, but what I think I just heard Mr. Kennedy just say is that what we're planning on is that what we currently have for the farmer's market, our property that we're using for the farmer's market is primarily what we're going to be using in the future. So, you know, and this here, maybe I'm wrong, but what I, what I think I heard was that we're not particularly planning on using this primarily for an expansion of the farmer's market, and if that's the case, why would we even do this? If, if we're not going to expand the farmer's market and use it that way, why would we spend $6,500 of money? You know, I don't care if it's $6,500 or $65,000. Why would we do that without, you know, our primary purpose of expanding the farmer's market? The farmer's market is basically May through October, one night a week from 5 o'clock or excuse me, four o'clock until seven o'clock, right? This park lends itself to a great opportunity for a neighborhood park, for more than just a farmer's market. So to answer your question, sure, we want to make the farmer's market a prominent feature within this park, but at the same time, there are other things that we would like to see associated with this park to provide for the people that live in this neighborhood whether it's trails, whether it's a playground, restroom facilities, uh, I don't know what else, a flower garden, uh, maybe a, a small shelter, I don't know. But those are all things that I think lend itself very well to this park that would be very appreciated by the people that live in this neighborhood and the people that live in Raymore in general. Other comments, questions? Well, I think what I've what I've heard here from the council is uh, they are interested in more definition before any commitment. Um, it would be useful to know, uh, as uh, Councilmember Westcote mentioned, if two years after the commitment, uh, the, the the church decided they wanted their land back, what what recourse would the city have? I think it would also be useful to know, at least in a more general sense, uh, how that land's going to be used. 
uh, in, in the park. So, other comments? Uh, go ahead. Just one final one. You know, as I'm, I'm looking at the layout of, of this city block, you know, that could even, that site, once the, the house is removed, could even be the, the site of a community garden, um, which is something that I, I know that several uh, organizations have expressed interest in. So, and it's, you know, that's something that we could put in that's not a, a permanent fixture, but at the same time would be a very effective use of the land. If I might make a suggestion, um, at the back end of the, the opening item, it, it, it says that if the council has no objections, we would have the attorneys go at it where we would be addressing things like payback on the initial outlay of cash should one side or the other back out of this, especially if the church backed out of it, so that we would get a recoupment of, of an amortized amount. Uh, that's one of the things they would be looking at within the final agreement, I think, is what I'm hearing from the council. Uh, at the same time that that's going on, perhaps uh, Mr. Kennedy could come up with, when we do final present a contract to the council, in conjunction with the park board, a slightly more defined plan. By then, uh, the original town task force will have met a couple more times, hopefully, and we can have a kind of a plan for both of the areas one being a little bit more conceptual as far as the new ground is concerned. Would that be acceptable to everyone? I'm seeing some nods and a couple of negative nods, but for the most part, some positive nods. <laughs> okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. 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 Mayor, uh, <clears throat> I've been to the farmer's market about every Tuesday since it opened up all during the summer. And if you'll notice in looking at the map, the only places that you have people that are doing any far or any marketing is right along that sidewalk there that is on Washington Street. All of the other area in through there is not being used. So we've got room for, we could put 10 times more people in there than what we've already got. Because if you will look, if you could do it where the sidewalk is, that's exactly where all of them, and they pay a premium to have that sidewalk area. Yeah, and, and, and if I remember right, there is uh, a number of people that set up along Olive Street and then uh, over in the treed area there. Uh, there's a lot of folks that set up over there. Uh, and then towards the back half or the center in this drawing, there is a number of uh, uh, carts that were brought in uh, for, for there. And in fact, that's where the entertainment is, if I remember right, uh, about dead center in that piece of property. Right? You know, from a, from a conceptual a conceptual standpoint it would actually make more sense if this was going to stay a strict farmers market to actually run sidewalks down the middle of the property mm -hmm. uh, maybe even a couple of rows of those that are all parallel uh, that way it sets up that vendor space but that's yeah. this is just from a conceptual standpoint something for the park board to think about yeah. uh, council member on this church property thing we're talking about the recoup of money if we're not going to use it for farmers market how would you recoup your money anyway what, what plans do you have? Uh, I'll let John go after this. The recoupment that I was talking about was to address Council Member Westcote's concern that if the church backed out early before the 10 years was up, that there would be something within the MOU where we would get an, some sort of a formulary money back because we didn't have it for the entire 10 years. You know, the, w the way I was looking at the $6,500 over 10 years at 650 so call it, you know, what, $50 a month uh, for the city to lease the land from the church, yeah. Assum assuming that there was no other improvements on exactly. it that couldn't be removed. Well, I know that's, that's not very much money, but I just wondered if there was any plans that, to recoup that well, investment. What would and you do? I'll let uh, Mr. Kennedy ad address that, but what I heard was this is parkland, not necessarily... Uh, parkland uh, exclusive to the farmer's market use or something like that? I, th there is no formula to recoup the investment in park property in general. <clears throat> if, you, if you have a facility like a ball field maybe that you can rent out or a shelter house that you could rent out, sure. But generally those don't even come close to paying what the capital costs are uh, associated with those. I mean, it's, it's quality of life that we're providing, and I guess if you want to try to put a price on that, 
$6,500 to me is very reasonable if we develop a park area that's used and appreciated by the people that live in our community. I would agree with that, John. I, I would also, um, I think it'd be easier to define and understand if we did have a plan. And so I, I think that once the planning is done, um, I think we can have that. But I don't think we as a park board even have an idea, a true sense of what's going to go on that other side at this time. So I think, I think right now, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, ambiguity or a lot of questions that even we have. So I don't think we can. Mm -hmm. well, I agree. I think everybody would be a little more comfortable or for or against it with more data. So, so. Other comments? OK. Well, that takes care of the two park board items. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Council, you, you need to stay here. Uh, park board, you can go home now. <laughs> we'll go ahead and take a break until uh, 10 minutes after 8, at which time we'll reconvene the work session for the council items. Thank you. Should I flash the line? Yeah. Work session, so. Oh, okay. No, I'll just speak closer to the microphone. All righty. Uh, the next item on our agenda tonight is Unified Development Code. Uh, oh, this is for the set sidewalks. Jim, would you like to toss it to Jim? I'd love to toss it to Jim. Jim? <laughs> Thank you, sir. If you recall, back at the uh, October uh, 7th City Council work session, we held a, a special uh, public hearing regarding a code provision that uh, actually became effective on January 1st of 2014. And that was regarding sidewalks and undeveloped lots. As a reminder to council, what that requirement means is that uh, if there is a, there's a code provision that if you own a property, an undeveloped lot, and 66% of the lots on that side of the street of that block have a home and a sidewalk, that you would be required to install sidewalk on that undeveloped lot. During that public hearing, we heard, we heard testimony from residents that wanted to have the sidewalk on undeveloped lots. We heard testimony from builders on the process and uh, staff identified uh, what we thought at the time would be uh, how we would administer and enforce that code provision in that sidewalk uh, notice it would go out to the property owners of uh, the lots that be affected they would have 120 days to install the sidewalk if they did not we would hold a public hearing if council decided that the city would install the sidewalk we would then uh, go through a bidding process, hire a contractor, have the sidewalk installed, and then assess the cost um, for that to the property through a special tax assessment. And all that needed to occur before September 1st in order for the uh, uh, item to be added to the, to the property taxes as a special tax assessment for the December 31st uh, tax notice. At the end of the uh, work session, council uh, there was, there was no consensus to uh, deviate from that code requirement, so staff began the process of looking to administer and enforce that code provision. So as we, after the public hearing um, in October, staff worked on developing and finalizing that process, and there were a couple of concerns that we identified that we wanted to bring to your attention uh, with a pro proposal to uh, modify what was uh, initially discussed back in in October uh, the first concern is that when we look at the actual time frame needed to complete this entire process we could not get it done uh, before October 30th of this year what that means is that we would not be able to add if the city spent money on prop on installing the sidewalk on a property we would not be able to have the special tax assessment for the 
uh, taxes that would be due at the end of 2014, it wouldn't be placed as a tax assessment at 20, until 2015. By doing that, the city would uh, basically have an obligation where, or a risk where we would potentially not be able to recoup our cost if that lot would sell before we had the special tax assessment added to the property. So we could spend money on a lot. If that lot sold, we would not be able to recoup our, our cost for that project. Uh, one of the concerns, uh, another concern that we had came from the public hearing was that it was felt 120 days was not enough time for a property owner to be able to install the sidewalk if they got notice in January due to inclement weather. So if they only had 120 days and you know 30 to 60 days in January and February were, were eliminated because of inclement weather, they didn't have a lot of time to comply with the code provision. And then a final concern that we had dealt with the number of lots we are talking about and the potential that the city would have to install sidewalk on those lots uh, and we for the 2014 budget we do not have a line item for this particular sidewalk project so we have a total of 89 lots currently on our list that would require sidewalk if we had to install sidewalk at all 89 lots we're talking hundred and sixty thousand dollars that we did have budgeted so we would need to do a budget amendment in order to to accomplish this project what we are proposing at this time is to modify the timeline and extend the entire process out we feel it's a better process for the lot owner we think it's fair to give them additional time we want to reduce the risk the city has if we have to install sidewalk of not being reimbursed so we want to make sure that when we install sidewalk we're able to quickly add that item on as a special tax assessment so any funds that are spent we would get reimbursed for so we're proposing a modified timeline where uh, we would notify the 89 lot owners that are currently required to install sidewalk uh, early early this month and allow them until August 1st of 2014 to install the sidewalk on their lot for those property owners that do not comply with the requirement by August 1st, we would then schedule a public hearing in September and October for each one of those lots that didn't comply. Uh, the public hearing is required by code where we, uh, the city council would then determine if city funds were to be utilized to install sidewalk on that property. From, from the public hearings, we would develop the list of properties where we would uh, install sidewalk and we would prepare a request for proposal to hire a contractor to do that work for us that uh, process would occur through uh, November December and we would bring a contract to City Council in January to hire a contractor to install sidewalk on those segments that we decided we were going to uh, the city was going to do and we would allow the contractor uh, until July 1st of 2015 to install those sidewalk segments on the property after the completion of the work we would invoice the property owner and allow them until August 1st to make payment on that invoice and for those that didn't make payment we would then supply the information to the county assessor by their September 1st deadline of 2015 to add to the taxes for uh, payable December 31st of 2015 so it does lengthen out the entire process. We think it's fair and the, the lot owner is given an additional time, has good weather to install the sidewalk, and we reduce the risk that the city has of not being reimbursed for our cost. The only thing that uh, unfortunately doesn't occur is the installation of sidewalk in 2014. If the city's going to install the sidewalk, it would be delayed until 2015. So it does lengthen the time frame that we had initially told individuals we would have sidewalk in their neighborhoods but it does seem to set up a better system for the overall program and one final comment uh, this is not a one-and-done uh, program so we've uh, we thought that we would establish January 1st of each year as the cutoff date so we know as of January 1st of 2014 there are 89 lots that are required to have sidewalk installed that number will not go up. It will only go down as this process and timeline uh, goes, goes forward. And that if, if a, uh, somebody comes in and pulls a permit on one of these lots, then that sidewalk is eliminated from the list. For any sidewalk uh, segments that would be triggered from January 1st uh, forward, for example, if I issued a permit tomorrow for a, 
for a undeveloped lot and then it triggered other lots on that block now requires sidewalk those new lots would be added to the list beginning of 2015 so we have a finite number that we can budget on so as we go forward we we utilize the august 1st deadline because then we would know what number we would need to budget for the 20 uh, fiscal uh, 2015 budget and again that number only decreases as we move on and we would uh, if for some reason you know we have that august 1st deadline but if that homeowner or, or a builder builds on that lot before the day we install sidewalk then we don't incur that concur that cost and we eliminate that lot from our list so the number will continually go down until if you would the day that we go to install sidewalk uh, off of that list so that's that's the program as we would like to present it to you uh, we're asking for uh, a consensus this evening in that uh, if you feel that this is agreeable that we would uh, bring forward a resolution at your at your next meeting on the 13th for uh, to memorialize this entire program and to begin uh, the administration enforcement of it uh, this January. Okay, thank you. Questions? Uh, Council Member Kellogg? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This might be different than what we've done in the past, but I kind of want to know if it's a possibility and what thoughts are and feasibility of doing it. Uh, would it be worth considering uh, getting a Pre, um, pre need bid proposal or agreement with with the contractor before any violations take place hammering out an agreed price before in the case that we may need this instead of waiting until the point that it is needed and then sending making up the, the resolution to send out an RFQ does that make sense well, I, one concern that would come to my mind real quick, is we're dealing with 89 sidewalks, um, and if 85 of them got built, uh, there would only be four. You know, if we had asked a, a contractor, hey, uh, there's, there's a chance that we're going to have 89 sidewalks, uh, shoot a surprise for it, they'd b base it on the materials for 89. Uh, and that's not, I, I appreciate your comment, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is approaching contractors prior to anything in, in saying hey if paraphrasing or, or kind of thinking ahead if we have this work can we come to a, an agreed price per sidewalk or per linear foot can you know can we write up a contract to if we need that service regardless if it's five lots 15 lots or 85 lots can can we do that uh, council McKellar, I, I only speak of experience of representing a lot of these contractors. I, I know that we legally could do it. The problem is contractors, the cost of aggregate fluctuates so dramatically. I would be concerned that a lot of contractors would be hesitant to try to lock themselves in for fear that, you know, that cost could jump within a few months. And, and I think that might be a really Mr. Boehner, would you, or Council Member Boehner, would you like to join in? I was just gonna say that the, the contractors would probably give themselves a, a sizable float in order to make that work for them. Yeah. Other questions? And, uh, oh, Mr. Grass. I gotta remember to turn. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> to answer Mr. Kellogg's question maybe, and very similar to the answer that you've heard, we've tried something very similar to that with uh, neighboring cities with a, with, a oh. joint, with a joint bidding contract, kind of like a piggyback contract and the con or a cooperative contract or those type of things that other other entities can use and the contractors have really really balked and have really inflated their prices unless there is an exact known quantity of mm -hmm. of material to ma material to be put in so what i'm hearing you say is can you give us a per foot price we'll pre-negotiate a pre foot pre uh square foot price for the concrete but we don't know how much exactly we're going to be putting in the contractors really inflate their prices when they when when or we found that when we've done that on the cooperative contract they have really inflated the prices and thank you i appreciate that it's a very good answer and thank you mr moorhead <laughs> <laughs> <And> mr boehner <laughs> i had to think about it even though i knew it 
Well, wait, That's well, why wait, I asked that question. You didn't call him West Coast. You call him Boehner? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Cataract, uh, you, you know, the, one of the things that I remember when we just talked about this during a public session was we were kind of trying to scoot the time in because we were concerned about people kind of lagging or voluntarily choosing not to put these sidewalks in. Um, the concern I have with the revised process is between task one and four, that's six months. Um, you know, the, at this point, you know, I think about, uh, as I advise tax clients, you know, when you deposit a check January 2nd of 2014, you don't recognize that income until April 15th of 2015. And my fear is, like you had mentioned, if a neighbor pulls a permit today, that it could affect neighbors that would then have to receive notice. They would, they would fall on the 2015 kind of calendar. Then based on this format, which is 11 months long, you're looking at two years before we get to task seven. And my concern is, could, is there a way to, because I'm looking at if the deadline's August 1st, how many sessions do we have to have to potentially drag it out to the end of October for the public hearing deadline? And then why couldn't we, once it's approved by us at, at, in the council hearing, have the RFP the next session or implemented relatively quickly after that and get that contract to us prior to that six month deadline. Instead of holding the deadline out to July 1st, we could make it May 1st and we could more than easily meet the county assessor deadline. Uh, these are just food for thought. I'd love to hear your comments. We did have a lot of discussion at that at the staff level and for the the reason that was given to Councilmember Kellogg's question earlier is we have to have a known quantity of how many sidewalks we're going to be installing and from a time frame standpoint in order to get the RFP out in order to get, give them time to respond in order to go through the contract award process and then to give them enough time to build the sidewalk and then we have to do the invoice and provide them the time frame to pay the invoice for the lot owner we can't accomplish all that before September 1st we tried to 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 reduce the timeline and we just don't believe it's possible to do that my biggest concern of the timeline though was prior to the issuance of the contract though because we go six months from the the deadline to the homeowner to the initiation of the contract itself could that ta the, between this time between task one and four be at, you know could that gap be closed a little bit to maybe start that latter process quicker? You're still looking, are, are you still talking about the new time frame and the work actually being completed in 2015? No, well, I'm just referring to the homeowner deadline to the issuance of the contract in January to the council. I mean, can we get to that contract quicker? I understand they're not going to be pouring any concrete in January, or February, but you know, if, if that contract was issued a little earlier than that, can they get to that earlier? Could we maybe not go all the way into July of the subsequent year? That time frame could probably redu be reduced, yes. But you know, the whole issue was, you know, I, initially I thought you were talking about trying to get it completed in 2014, which we don't believe we can, but we could reduce the time frame. Um, somewhat, I don't know what overall benefit that gives other than getting the sidewalk in earlier in 2015 is that that's your goal well the biggest concern was first of all if we're going to get stuck putting in a sidewalk I want to get that invoice to that homeowner as soon as possible I want I, per, you know it's kind of uh, somewhat understandable that more homes tend to sell more in the in the summer months and the winter months so I'd like to be able to get something on file at the county when homes are moving and I'd like to more than adequately be the uh, county assessor's deadline. Mm -hmm. well, what, what comment to make? Um, it doesn't matter when we turn the assessment information into the county, they only process it the week after September 1st. So it doesn't matter. We want to reduce the time frame between the time we spend money and September 1st. We don't want to increase it, we want to decrease it and get it as close as possible. Because if, if we put the sidewalk in in April mm -hmm. we won't we know we won't get reimbursed if that lot sells before September 1st when I turn that in that assessment information to the county assessor on September 1st 
then I know I can get reimbursed. Yes, um, the extended timeline is just for the first year. Then, because after 14, 15, once we get into the calendar year 2015, the, however many lots are left are identified January 1st. They have until the end of April, the 1st of May, to put those sidewalks in. Then if they don't do it, then we issue the contract and it's done by July. They get invoiced in August and then it goes on the tax roll in September. So after this first year, because of the compressed time frames, afterwards, everything is done within one calendar year, one cycle, is that correct? That, that's not the way the program's set up. It would be the same. The, the first year program would be the same every year after. So sidewalks that would be triggered in 2014 would get noticed uh, in January of 2015 and then not, and we wouldn't install a sidewalk until 2016. This time frame is consistent from every year forward. It's how much time it's gonna take every year for us to do this program. If we're going to give the homeowners I, I, I you know, guess. adequate time to install the sidewalk. Well, aren't, aren't they noticed up in in January? Uh, okay, let, let's forget 14 for a minute. Let's look at 15. So January 1st, we've identified however many sidewalks that need to be done. A notice gets sent to those people saying they have 120 days to comply. Is that correct? That's not currently how we've set it up. We've set it up for uh, 210 days. I thought it was 120 and all this. That's what we initially talked about when we were trying to get the program done within a calendar year, but we, we are not able to do that. So we are talking 210 days as a minimum amount of time a, a lot owner would have. What I would propose to do out of fairness is, I give the example, we have the January 1st cutoff date. If I receive a permit tomorrow, for a lot and it then triggers other lots on that side of the street. I would send them a, I think I should send them a courtesy notice that your lot has now been triggered for this program and this is the time frame that you would have to install the sidewalk. I wouldn't just sit on that information and wait <laughs> until January 1st of 2015 and then send them the notice. Once it's triggered, they should be noticed, but we can't, we, we need to have a cutoff date for uh, budgeting purposes and administration purposes. That's why I use January 1st as a cutoff date. I don't want to keep modifying that number mm -hmm. where, where it ebbs and flows throughout the year. I need to have that cutoff date. Um, but at the same time, I want to be able to provide as much notice to a lot owner, especially one that's, that's being notified for the very first time that this, this has now uh, triggered the requirement. The 89 lots that we've been talking about, these individuals have already been notified twice over the last couple of years. So they're very familiar, should be familiar with the program. It's the new lots that I wanna give more than adequate time than 120 days to be told for the very first time that you have to install sidewalk on this property. It just didn't seem very fair. Jim, correct me if I'm I'm wrong on this. It, it, during staff discussion on this council member, council members, one of the one of the issues that came up was the council's clear desire that each of these lot owners have the opportunity to come before the council to explain their case and to seek an appeal process. If if we notify them now this month, we still have to get through that appeal process know exactly how many lots we have get a request for proposal on the street get it back which we need to give it at least three to four weeks on the street for one like this get it back and get the work done before the deadline hits where we would have to notify the county assessor that was a very compressed time frame to still give them an appeal outlet Ms. Mr. Cater at this kind of is still in line with Mr. what Mr. Westcott brought up, was bringing up. So you, what this is doing, though, is for me, because I was working forward with the 120-day concept, what I'm now hearing is, is you're saying that this kind of harmonizes with the county assessor deadline back to kind of make it fit instead of just a rolling ball forward constant. So each each case would have its own process you're trying to get everybody on a similar track yes okay. councilmember Delgawan 
I like the idea that this gives people a little bit more time to do it themselves, or if they end up not doing it themselves, at least to have a little more notice that they may be $2,000 out of pocket to put a sidewalk in. You know, just knowing, talking to people who often don't pay much attention to what's going on in the city as long as all is well in their little lot, they're happy with the world. And so um, it, would, it would be a big blow to some families to get something in the mail that says, you have to put in a sidewalk and, and then they think, oh, put it aside, put it aside, put it aside, and then all of a sudden a bill for $2,000, that's, that's a big deal. I'm in favor of giving them more time, and especially considering that this actually went into effect in 2009, and we've already put it off and put it off and put it off. I think there's, I mean, I know people want sidewalks, and I think there's value to that, which is why we've started rolling the ball, but I think there's no need to go full sprint with it. Council Member Wisco? And, and, and I'm okay with giving people more time. Um, but just for clarification, the majority of the people that are going to be affected by this are developers. And they have some idea, or at least they should have some idea, when they're looking at their master plan that says, oh, you know what, I just hit threshold. So the majority of the people that are going to be impacted by this are developers who should see it coming if they're good business people. That is correct. Most of, most of the 89 lots are owned by builders or developers, yes. Other questions? Concerns? All right, we'll move forward with that one. In that case, then, we will be bringing this as a resolution for council consideration next Monday night. Okay, great. Uh, the next item, uh, Council Member Stevens, I believe it's yours. So if you'd like to take the ball from here and okay, tell us what your thoughts are. Well, that's pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, I propose that the section on Hubach Hill Road from J Highway to Haystack Road be increased from 35 to 40 miles per hour. Some of the sections in there uh, also lie in the county, so it'd be kind of a combined effort between uh, city and county. And I think that's about it, really. And I was, I'm just curious, why did you want the increase? Uh, you you want to increase the speed limit, why? Well, I've had a, a number of people ask me about it. More, probably more in word for it, because they had the longest to travel those roads. They've said that they would appreciate it if it was a little bit more speedy along those routes okay um who's going to give a staff report um i i suppose i can kind of start off okay. uh, with, <laughs> after we had received this from uh, council member stevens uh, both the the engineering department and the police department were consulted uh, from the standpoint of the engineering department and they could probably speak to this a little bit better uh, in the second paragraph of the staff report, you see that the average 85th percentile speed between Sunset Lane and Haystack was 41 miles per hour and the average speed 36.75. Dean Avenue, the 85th percentile speed was 44.24 and the average speed 39.5 at present. Uh, engineering did review the curve data on the construction plans and determined that the curves between Haystack and Old Mill Road do not meet design criteria for speeds over 35 miles per hour. Uh, the police department was asked to provide comments. Theirs was a more dynamic uh, investigation into it in that they actually conducted actual driving tests and at both 40 miles per hour and 45 miles per hour through the curves that exist in the road. And in their opinion, the curves could not, meet, could not be safely navigated at either of those speeds. Uh, the department was also concerned about the impact of a higher speed limit on traffic pulling onto Hubach Hill Road from Haystack Road. I would uh, inform the council that we did receive correspondence from Mr. Spurgeon, who lives there. He, he had uh, several concerns, most of which centered around persons trying to pull out of their driveways uh, at a prevailing speed of 40 miles per hour. That's member Wisco. But, but isn't the isn't the average speed that people are traveling down that road now over 40, 41? Isn't that what that study said? So so the traffic, the majority of the traffic that's going down that road is already at 41 miles an hour. Isn't that what the data said? That's correct. But we, we did not we did not um, 
do the do the counts in the curves. But yes, on, on the on the straight sections, yes, the the <laughs> the eighty fifth percentile speed is is around forty. 40 miles an hour you or know, something. Yes. I, I totally concur and agree that the curves should be left at 35. But you know, when you exit um, I-49 and come across the bridge, it's 45. And then right at Dean, it goes to 35. And then coming up out of there, I, I can, don't see why it couldn't go to 40 all the way uh, you know, through uh, either uh, school, uh, uh, Madison or Jay. Um, the, the way that I kind of see it is if, if that is a little bit quicker access and the traffic moves along, maybe more people will tend to use it and traffic counts then bring businesses down at the other intersection. Council member of Dogawood. I disagree. I think that, that a road where the speed limit changes multiple times is confusing for people. Um, most people don't drive looking for the speed limit sign. <coughs> And so I think it's really confusing if you're on a road where the speed limit goes 45, 35, 45. Um, and then my other point is, obviously most people don't drive the speed limit, they drive above it. So if we raise that speed limit, I would be fearful that people would be driving 55, 60 down that road and that is absolutely not safe, not to mention the, um, the danger of driving 45 around those curves like some people are doing anyway. Just because people do it doesn't mean it's right. Councilmember Stevens. Most of this area is pretty much rural, and there's a lot. Uh, the sight lines are pretty long as well. I mean, it's, it's like driving out in the country. I don't understand what the problem is. Councilmember Wesco. And it actually kind of follows what the county does um, once you get outside of the outside of the areas. You know, it goes from 35 to 45. Um, you know, uh, Hubach Hill or North Cass Parkway. Uh, at J Highway becomes, or I guess it's just past J Highway, becomes 45 miles an hour. Um, you know, take it from 35 to 40. You know, again, that's everybody's driving over 40 miles an hour now. And if and if the, the average is 41, then some people are doing 70. You know, and I think we've actually heard, I, I believe the mayor heard it on a scanner one time, that somebody being pulled over. Or maybe maybe it was somebody else. My mistake, but uh, somebody was in excess of, of 70 miles an hour. Well, that um, wasn't. That, I didn't hear that one. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I taking it to 40 miles an hour since everybody's driving it now. I, I don't see where the the big issue uh, is. Of course, if you posted it at 40, everybody's going to do 50, right? So, Jim. Um, and just for council's clarification, and I'll probably need help on this again because I keep getting confused. Uh, if you guys could both turn your mics on and jump in and help me for a second. <laughs> There's different enforcement areas along this road. Um, I believe from here to here, which would be right. no, sunset. Sunset. sunset, is uh, entirely enforced by the city and maintained by the city, correct? Correct, yep. And yes. then from sunset to here it is all county enforcement and all county maintenance <laughs> and then from here to here is all city maintenance but this section here the north side is city enforcement and the south side is county enforcement that's correct <laughs> mr mayor it looks like a speed trap just in the making let's let's leave it all uniform all the way across but that's the challenge. It's not uniform all the way across. It's it goes 45, and then it's 35, and and, and is a section of it 25, or yeah. it stays 35, and then it goes back up to 45. If I recall correctly, it goes back to 45 once you're out past uh, Prairie Lane. I, I don't recall it uh, jumping up before you get that far okay. east. And and the, and, and the road degrades dramatically after Plurid <laughs> as you're driving out. Other comments? Okay, uh, Councilmember Stevens, this was your item. Would you like this to come before the council as an official item? Okay, thank you. And we'll move on to the last one, credit card convenience fees. Jim, is this one yours? Yes, it, it was going to be Miss Watson's, but she's on crutches, so I'm going to take it for <laughs> or something like that. Um, the, the matrix study that was done in 2010 uh, had 
as one of their suggestions to the city that we consider uh, implementing convenience fees for all of our, our credit card purchases, uh, whether online or at the window. Uh, the city currently offers credit card transactions to our customers in person, by phone, and online, and we accept Visa, MasterCard, and Discover. Uh, the, the, convenient, the charges, which are the convenience fee charges for each of those, they vary between 1.55 and 2.31 to the city, depending on the card and the type of transaction that's being done. Uh, the fee isn't currently passed on to our customers, and staff was very much uh, perplexed by how we were going to actually implement this because Visa had some uh, uh, changing and somewhat onerous rules that they put on as far as being able to do it. It began with them not allowing it for, for theirs, then they would allow it for theirs, but you had to have certain elements in place for the other cards as well as far as restrictions were concerned. Finally, recently, Visa did remove most of the restrictions that they have on their cards. They do, however, have a couple that, that would still make it somewhat inconvenient for both the city and for our customers at large. Uh, if the city were to begin charging the convenience fee, we can't charge a convenience fee that is more to the customer than is more than we are being charged. Because that varies, we would probably have to come up with one flat percentage rate that we were very careful about not going over on any transaction or we would be in violation of every transaction associated with this. Um, again, the average is 1.81%. If the city were to charge the 1%, uh, we would recognize approximately 16498 in revenue by charging these convenience fees. Uh, to, to reference back, we do approximately $1,649,807 in a, in a period where we would be charging to get $16,498 back. Uh, staff did conduct a survey of 14 local Missouri cities. None of them charged the convenience fee. The cities were probably one of the last groups that Visa gave on to allow for the convenience fees to be charged. In addition, you do not charge convenience fees on debit card purchases. So you have to announce to the customer that you're, that you're going to be charging them a 1% convenience fee. It has to be posted on the building, at the window, on the website, and then you verbally have to tell the customer. You also have to allow the customer, if they so choose, to use a debit card and not be charged the convenience fees, which means we'd have to put point of purchase readers that the customer could actually use outside of all of our windows where we had these at a cost of about 600 each for an additional 2,400, which would eat into that 16,000 that we would be making. Again, the disclosure to the customer uh, automatic uh, monthly credit card payments convenience fee can't be imposed for the authorized monthly recurring transactions that take place. In other words, it's got to be a point of purchase transaction. If somebody has an automatic debit going on, you can't charge for that because that's not considered convenient for them. Uh, the recommendation of staff, obviously, because of all of these four factors, is that we continue as we are and not charge the customers the convenience fee. I would concur. It sounds like if we make this fee, it sounds more like a nuisance fee than it does anything else. So I think let's leave it like it is. Let's go with the staff's recommendation. Councilmember Wesco. Uh, the the $1.6 million that we collected, where does the majority of that come from? Is that through water payments or is that through court fees? Oh, water, water payments by definitely. Yes. Any other comments? Uh, if I could add one other item Please. to it. Uh, when we, do, we did survey each of the departments that, that collects this, um, court has been doing phenomenally well with using the credit card. Uh, they have the most significant concern that if we started charging a convenience fee, they would see that drop. 
but we have seen their collections go up dramatically in using the credit cards. And, and that wasn't that long ago that we went to uh, credit cards there, was it? Begin last year. Yeah, last beginning, year? yeah. Last year? Beginning okay. of last fiscal year. Uh, anybody uh, just really, really, really want to put in a convenience fee or a, what, uh, Council Member Hubach, you called it a nuisance fee. Uh, anybody else want to chime in and suggest we put in a nuisance fee? Uh, Council Member Kellogg? No, I don't want to chime in on that opinion, but I, I will say <laughs> this, because I was just down to uh, the tax collectors down in Harrisonville two days before the first of the year, and uh, I noticed they had a sign on their wall there that if you pay in a credit card, it's 2.5% of the, uh, lack of a better term, purchase. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it just, I, I appreciate what staff's doing here, and, you know, I say it's just kind of a, I, I guess I'll, I'll give the slam where the slams do, do and that's down at the county county uh, tax assessor. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you haven't spoken in a little while, but please Fair take enough. the next half hour. Well, and Council Member Kellogg, I did mine online. They still got me for that 2%. <laughs> but I, I think so much for convenience, huh? Amen. Um, but I do have to say, you know, based on what I'm hearing with all the administrative steps we're going to have to take to, I mean, it's just, it's not just a nuisance for the person paying it. It's really a little bit of a nuisance for us to administer, to disclaim, to allow exemption. I mean, it just, to me, it sounds like a sense of frustration. Especially when not a large amount. Yeah, of especially when we don't know who would not pay then, right. you know, that makes it then a collection issue. I actually pay mine with a check. And there were no, no no fees associated with that. Uh, but do we are? It, it's one of the very few checks that I actually write. Um, do we charge a fee right now uh, f for somebody to pay their water bill online? We there there is a fee that is charged. It's a pass through fee that Civic Plus has because we use it's through the website and through Encode. I think Encode has one as well, don't they? Yeah, we pay the the Encode portion of it. Uh, that's our financial software package. So it's, it's a mirroring of our website and ENCODE software. We do pay the, the customer, it's passed on to them for the website component to have that convenience, but the ENCODE charge is slashed. Any final comments? Council Member Stevens? Uh, could I make it just a little more clear on the speed limit thing? If we can't get the uh, county to cooperate and, and make the speed limits the same on their side of the road, I'm really not in favor of doing it at all. Okay, so the first step would be to go to the county, and then if, uh, if, if they're not in agreement, then just, just drop it? Okay. Okay. Very good. That's, thank you for the direction. Yeah, that, 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 that was very good. Uh, Council Member Kellogg? Kind of like dovetail on what he just said there, you know, and this is what I was thinking about during the discussion is that would it be possible, feasible, or even advisable for us to annex the, the, the right-of-way there along those roads so we can uh, regulate that, like what we've done in other parts of uh, the city, is particularly out to the east of town on 58, do, for enforcement purposes? Do we maintain the section of the road that's in the county? Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Krause for clarification on that. I have a thought, but I want to be sure. Where, where's Mr. <laughs> if you need a map. They have the map. I've got, I've got the map. I've got the map. The, yes. Um, it, with, the exception, with the exception of the area between approximately Oak and Sunset, the, everything else we do, we do ma maintain. Uh, east of School Road, we, we, start somewhere near the near the bridge or the culvert there near oak and then we go east from there by by agreement from from um from quite a few years ago out to uh prairie out to prairie lane so the portion that's in the county is entirely the county maintenance and yes and then the areas that are you know, half and half and half we maintain. Okay, okay. So the, the area where if, if you're driving on this side, you're going to get a ticket from the county. And if you're driving on that side, you're going to get a ticket from... We, and we if maintain. you spin, you're going to get a ticket from both. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so, we maintain those. So so we, we pay to maintain them, but we don't enforce any of the laws on the roads that we actually pay to maintain. 
might be a good idea to look at the, the roads that we are maintaining to bring those in. I concur with that. I would ask that we direct staff as a council to investigate that so we can allow our police give the policy to the police so we can set the regulation of, of that speed limit. On the other hand, the roads that the county is maintaining, I, I would suggest that we allow the county to continue to maintain those roads. Okay, everybody's in agreement there. <laughs> Isn't that why we pay our taxes to the county? All righty. Hey, hey, right. Just a point of clarification. Okay. Uh, so if it is the council's desire that we first look at an annexation process of the road, then well, no, would you want that to be a, a step it's in a, there? It's a, no, it's a, it's a separate item. Okay. The, the, first, the first item is uh, there's a section of the county uh, maintained road that uh, uh, Council Member uh, Stevens was interested in increasing the speed limit. Right. And if the county does not want to increase the speed limit there, okay. that, that item is dead. The, the next item is we're maintaining a portion of the county road that isn't ours. Right. So, <laughs> so speed limit first, and, annexation and consideration second. second. Thank you, sir. All righty. And we have no executive items this evening? No executive items. We would report to the council that uh, the chief of police has oh. been released from the hospital and decided to come back to work today. Yay. <laughs> well, and all right, if uh, nobody has any other items, we're in adjournment. Thank you, everybody. Stay warm. Happy New Year, by the way.